This is the You Show Podcast. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome in to the You Show Podcast. It's been a while. I'm Chris Treft, along with Ben Gisselson. Ben, how you been, man? Oh, man, it's good to hear your voice. Good to see your face over Zoom. Brent as well, who is always the figure looming overhead, producing, making sure we don't say anything stupid. Great to see you guys. Uh, it's been a while. We went from talking about the beginning of hockey, talking to players and coaches about the beginning of hockey, to watching hockey, which has been just a joy and a treat. And I really have come to appreciate the game even more than I did before all of this happened in our world. Uh, so it's been a great few weeks here and, and months since we've last gathered to watch hockey. And I know you guys are thinking the same thing and everybody in the world's thinking the same thing uh, because hockey's back. And that's been a, a, a real, real treasure of mine over the last few weeks. We'll touch on the playoffs a little bit, but we're going to get an even better perspective, possibly the best perspective you can get in the game of hockey. Eddie Olchek is our guest today, a very special guest. And so he's going to have a nice insight on, obviously, how the bubble is going, how the playoffs are going. And he's the, you know, the top color commentator on NHL and NBC for the National Hockey League. So it's, uh, you can't get a much better perspective than that. But from, from your side of things, the playoffs have been great, Ben. What have you thought so far, um, especially with all the USHL guys that are making such big impacts? Well, firstly, you nailed it, Chris, thrilled about having Eddie Olchek on here and not only perspectives on the playoffs, but we were talking about this before we hit the record button a little bit. This guy has so many different perspectives of the way he's had to analyze the game of hockey as a player, as a coach, as a broadcaster. And not that that's an unprecedented path. We've seen that before, but to do it the way he's done it, to have such a successful career and then to be a head coach in the NHL with Pittsburgh. And then to be the lead analyst with NBC Sports, he's been the lead analyst of, of NHL hockey in America for as long as I can remember, whether it's been on Versus or NBC or you name it. So that's going to be a blast. Uh, can't wait to get that out to our fans here in just a few minutes. But yes, the playoffs, uh, where to begin? As we sit now, as we record this, August 26th, we've got eight teams left. I always tend each round to cater to one or two specific series. This round has been Dallas and Colorado so far to me. It is as electrifying of a brand of hockey as you can ask for. Uh, it, it's had every twist, every turn. Great comebacks by Dallas. Nathan McKinnon playing in a completely different universe than the rest of the NHL right now has been a joy to watch. Uh, but all of it has been great. And even those qualifying rounds where I think as hockey fans, we were all going, are we going to really get to see the level of animosity and the intensity that we've come to love and, and appreciate about playoff hockey? And sure, there was a little bit of getting back into the swing of things and maybe game one or maybe game two, but some of those series were hot right out of the start, but all of them got to a great level by at least game three, and it's only elevated from there. And I give the NHL credit in terms of how they've established a viewing point for fans because it took a little bit to get used to the no fans in the arena, but it really isn't phasing me anymore. And not that I don't want fans to obviously eventually come back someday, but it's not deterring from my enjoyment of the game at all. Yeah. And if you really look at things, hockey is a sport where yeah, the crowd makes a huge difference, but when the NHL puts out a product like they have, it makes it that much better. Even like our guest Eddie O said on one of the broadcasts, it feels like one of the special events. If you were at the winter classic last year, with the, it feels like it's so far away from the rink when the Winter Classic, so I almost don't even get the crowd. But this has that same feel in the production aspect, what they did covering the seats and putting the extra video boards up. Like, man, I almost like this better than, than with the fans. <laughs> Obviously, you know, with the fans. Oh, that's a take. That's yeah. a take right there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just love hockey so much. Like, I, I couldn't care less if I'm watching a Pee Wee game or watching an NHL game. Like, I love the sport. Maybe, I don't say more than anybody, but I'm sure a bunch of people would argue with me. But I love it just as much as the, the next guy. So I just love seeing playoff hockey. And it's also, you know, it's those months that are normally super boring. August yeah. and September, like there's nothing hockey-wise. It's kind of like that lull 
Now we're getting hockey. Like, yeah, we had the three month break, but the NHL has done a, done a great job that USHL players are making an impact. Joe Pavelski, Blake Coleman. I mean, up and down the list, the, the guys that have played and come through the USHL are making an impact in the bubble. So it, it's really been, really been great to watch all aspects. That's a terrific point you made about this is hockey almost at its purest form. Yeah, they're on television, but that's the only kind of notoriety they're getting right now through this type of a playoff that we're seeing. It's just you, your teammates, and your staff, which is how you begin growing up as a hockey player. That's how it starts. Granted, you might have your parents in the fans during, or your parents in the stands during it. And a great production note from Brent as we were talking about liking not having fans right now he goes well wait till the cup gets lifted it's a great point but I've also thought about this too when the cup gets lifted yes the skate around to the fans is an iconic part of the Stanley Cup presentation but it's just going to be like I said earlier you and your teammates there so it'll be a really intimate moment of just you celebrating with your brothers that you bled with to get to that Stanley Cup championship and that will be a cool and unique moment I don't know if I want to see that ever again in my life, but yeah. this one time it'll be pretty cool. But I also feel like the teams that have won the Stanley Cup are all winning on the road in the past, what, 10 years, yeah. right? I feel, I feel like, you know, this obviously isn't an exact fact, but I feel like eight of 10, like that's just what it seems like. It feels like they win it on the road every year. So it's the same aspect, right? And so now you don't have people booing you or like the, <laughs> the, the you know, the random hundred people that were able to afford a ticket and, and get to the, get to the road game. So it's different, but it certainly, it certainly is great, to say the least. Well, speaking of Stanley Cups and guys who have won them, Eddie O won one towards the tail end of his career in New York, and there's my attempt at a segue. It's a rusty segue after being off of the air, so to speak, here for a little while now. Yeah, it works, right? It's, it's, all, you know, it's, not, it's not as bad as all of my cheesy segues. I hit a home run I every like, now. I like your cheesy also. segues, Chris. I like them. Don't, it, don't ever let that die. Yeah. Well, I, well, I hope not, so. Well, let's get right to it. NHL on NBC color analyst, Eddie Olchek. Well, everyone, now it's time for our special guest here on the You Show podcast. And I don't know if we've had a, a more prestigious guest to this point. We've talked to a lot of great USHL alumni and, and other guests. But from the NHL on NBC, former Stanley Cup champion, former coach in the National Hockey League, guys pretty much done it all, Eddie Olchek. Eddie, how are we doing today? I'm doing fine, Chris. Thanks for having me, guys. Nice to be with you, and uh, hopefully everybody is uh, staying safe and uh, abiding by all the uh, all the guidelines we're all living under. And uh, hopefully, uh, whatever the uh, the new normal is going to be, hopefully we'll be on the right side of this. So, good health to you and your family and everybody out there that's uh, that's watching. And uh, it's been in a, kind of an incredible run for all of us here. Not only the great game of hockey has been affected, but the, most importantly, all the lives that we are living on a daily basis have been affected. So uh, we're thinking about everybody out there and praying for them. And we, I'd like to thank all the frontline workers out there that have been uh, battling for all of us to allow us to uh, have our essential needs to get along. And the, all those people, uh, you know, the medical and, uh, you know, the, the, the doctors and the nurses and all those frontline workers out there are battling uh, this, uh, this pandemic. So it's great to be with you guys. And, uh, Hard to believe I'm right in the middle of uh, the National Hockey League playoffs in uh, the end of August, early September, and a uh, uh, pretty busy time, but it's nice to be back, and hopefully people are uh, enjoying the games, and we understand, and you know, I think my philosophy is, is look at, you know, we, we know what's going on in the real world, and, uh, you know, we hopefully people are, uh, you know, being distracted in the most professional way uh, by watching the National Hockey League and, uh, and the playoffs going on, and again, just take them away from the everyday goings on. So that's kind of my philosophy on how we're doing the games. And we understand what's going on, but also understanding is that uh, we have a job to do and hopefully people have been entertained and it's been a fun, uh, I guess, three and a half, uh, yeah, I guess three and a half weeks since the, uh, the NHL playoffs has started. Eddie, as someone as established as you, there probably aren't a whole lot of opportunities for learning curves on mm -hmm. the broadcast, but Everybody has new learning curve this year in every walk of life. For yeah. you, it's being in NBC Sports Studios while doing color commentary, whether it's in Toronto or in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. What has that whole process been like for you, and, and what's the learning curve been like? 
Yeah. Well, I think Ben that, you know, when, you know, as a, uh, as an analyst uh, and being so used to being in the arena, being able to see the game from a certain vantage point, um, and then now pretty much having to call it off of a monitor for the first, you know, three plus weeks of the playoffs. And eventually I'm going to work my way to Edmonton and be in the bubble there to get ready for the conference finals and then the final. But, um, you know, I, I've done games off of monitors before. Uh, like when we do, sometimes we do the stadium series games uh, or we do the winter classic. Sometimes our positioning isn't, uh, uh, it isn't as normal as it would be in a, in a, in a small venue. Uh, so it's kind of hard to see the players and to follow the play from so far away, say in a football stadium uh, or even a baseball stadium, we're sitting in a press box. So instead of watching the field or watching the ice, I just watch it off a of TV and call the game. So I've had experience of doing it now. It's not the same of being in the venue, but look, it's the world we're living in and uh, it's the hand that's been dealt to us as far as, you know, our little world of, of broadcasting games. But, you know, the challenge of communicating or working with a three-man booth when maybe you have two of the, two of the people on site or maybe, uh, you know, as Doc is, is uh, in an undisclosed location in Michigan. Uh, I happen to be home right now on my way to Edmonton, so I'm doing games from here. And then Brian Boucher is in Toronto inside the glass. So, you know, you're, you're not only dealing with, you know, watching the game and trying to keep an eye on what's going on, but also, too, the technical part of, you know, there is a delay, a slight delay that's going on, um, you know, not stepping on your partner, knowing when to get in. So I think there's a lot more communication uh, when you're talking about your producer and just saying, hey, you know, I'd like to get in there. So let the other two guys know that when the time presents, you know, maybe pause and I can jump in and get out. So um you know it's it's what it is and uh, it's been fun I mean it's just been fun to get back in the seat and put it and and, and put my headset on here and uh and uh, and do the games and uh like I said I everything I have I owe to the game of hockey and uh, but that's probably the biggest challenge Ben is is just that part of not being in the venue and then you know not being able to see everything like I, I love watching what happens behind the behind the play uh you know the extracurricular stuff um, when you're watching the games on TV, like when, I, when you're watching the games, everybody out there, I'm, yeah, I'm, what you're seeing is I'm seeing. Like I'm seeing off of my TV. Um, so, you know, is there some stuff that I've missed and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. But it's just the way that it is, and we're trying to do the best that we can. And I think people are, you know, understand for the most part. And, uh, but I'm looking forward to getting back uh, into a building. And, uh, and uh, even though we won't have any of the, you know, we, look at hockey fans are the greatest in the world. And I know we won't have any fans there. But, but uh, we'll be in the building to be able to, uh, uh, you know, to call the game. So, uh, you know, the learning curve is, is probably a little bit more communication than normal. And, uh, you know, we're doing the best that we can. That's the broadcast perspective. Want to talk about the on ice perspective now. Uh -huh. End around question to get there. Anybody sure. who knows Eddie Olchek knows your affinity for horse racing. <laughs> We're in, as of August 26th, it's an eight-horse race right now. Yeah. You've seen all these teams play now for a number of weeks. Who yeah. are the odds favoring the most in Eddie Olchek's eyes right now? Well, look, full disclosure, uh, at the start of the year, prior to the pause, um, I thought that the Dallas Stars and the Washington Capitals would find their way to the Stanley Cup final. And obviously, one of those teams has gone home already, and that being the Capitals. Um, I really thought that the Dallas Stars made a couple of key acquisitions over the course of the summertime. You know, they brought in Corey Perry, former Stanley Cup champion, and uh, a couple of times, actually, Corey Perry, and, uh, and, and a guy that I respect very, very much, a former grad of the United States Hockey League and the Waterloo Blackhawks, Joe Pavelski. Um, you know, I thought bringing in those two guys uh, with the experience that they have, the, uh, you know, the ability to be able to play in a lot of different situations, uh, I thought it was really key. And look, at people forget, they went to game seven double overtime last year against St. Louis and lost, and then St. Louis eventually went on to win the Stanley Cup. So uh, long-winded, I, I thought Dallas would be a sneaky team. And look, uh, unfortunately for Colorado, they lost, uh, you know, they lost their goaltender, uh, you know, Philip Grubauer. They lost Eric Johnson. Um, they've had some really good moments in the series up until this point, down 2 nothing. But, you know, Dallas looks like a team that just seems to be built for playoff hockey, and they got some pretty good defensemen back there. So 
Uh, you know, Vegas would be the other team, obviously, you know, with only four teams left. And, you know, Vegas seems to be the complete package. And in the Eastern Conference, I mean, look, the way that the New York Islanders are playing right now, uh, you know, you could make a case that, hey, you know, like they have everything going on. Um, you know, I, I thought that Boston initially, once the Final Four in the Eastern Conference started, just the way that they amped it up and, and what have you, and even with Tuka Rask opting out of the bubble, uh, I just thought that, you know, they could be a team that, uh, you know, could, could get to the Eastern Conference. So, um, you know, right now, as of this date, the, uh, you know, what is it, 25th, 26th of August? I don't even know what day it is. Um, I do know it's a Wednesday. That's the one we're taping this. But, um, you know, right now, I look at, I mean, you know, why can't it be, you know, why can't it be Dallas and the Islanders in the Stanley Cup final with the way those two teams are playing? Well, walking away from this interview, I will do so with my chest out. My dad and I always pick a preseason favorite. Mine was Dallas. So I'm glad okay. he thinks the same uh, as me. So, there you uh, go, Ben. I'm All right. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully your mind is great. I'm not so, I'm not sure, sure about the old guy on this call, but uh, hopefully our minds think alike here uh, with uh, maybe Dallas even getting to the Stanley Cup final. So a lot of hockey to be played, but uh, be uh, – be uh, be a lot of fun to see what takes place and looking forward to being on site there for the Stanley Cup final. Well, speaking of Dallas, you mentioned Joe Pavelski, USHL alum. When you think of USHL alums in the National Hockey League, obviously you mentioned Pavelski, but what's what are the names that come to mind, whether it's old school like Phil Housley or new school like Kyle, <laughs> Kyle Connor? What, what are those names when you think of USHL in terms of the NHL? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, it's, it's the number one feeder into, you know, into college hockey and, you know, look at for some guys, you know, they use the USHL as a, you know, as a, as a stepping stone to, you know, maybe go on and, and, and play major junior hockey and then, you know, go right to the National Hockey League. I mean, it happens. I think Sam Gagne is a perfect example of that, right? He played in Sioux City and then he decided he wanted to go to the Ontario Hockey League and that's what he did. I mean, so look at the USHL is, is for every type of hockey player regardless of, of their background or where they come from. Uh, you know, it's the number one route to go to U.S. colleges. It's, a, it's an incredible feeder, and I know the National Hockey League has taken a much greater notice over the course of, uh, you know, what, the last probably legit 10 years, I would say. And I'm just trying to think off the top of my head when my boys played in the USHL back uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, so, you know, look at, you know, whether it's, you know, it's a, it is a, a Max Pacioretty or a Brandon Montour or, you know, now with the relationship with USA Hockey and the, and the, and the national development team being a part of that, um, it's, it's an opportunity for uh, players uh, to develop, to be seen, uh, and to grow not only as hockey players, but to me, more importantly, the type of people that they are and they're going to be. Uh, that's really an important part of the maturation process of all players that go and and look too. Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, I, I'm hoping that you know more coaches, more trainers, uh, more staff members, more broadcasters can <laughs> use the can use the USHL as a stepping stone to uh, living their dream of getting. I would assume to the National Hockey League or to another professional league in some fashion. Um, so it's not only a feeder of that. And, you know, and, and Coop, John Cooper is a perfect example of, you know, a guy that spent some time in Green Bay. And then next thing you know, he's, you know, he's patrolling in Norfolk. And then all of a sudden he gets the opportunity in Tampa. So I, I just think that, you know, it's, it's important for the league. It's important. USHL, I'm talking about. It's important for the league. It's important for the ownership. It's important for the management teams of not only understanding you're in a developmental league and look at it's a business. Uh, you got people that pay money to come watch these teams play. And at the end of the day, it's, it is a business, but it is a developmental league. And I think the teams that have the most success realize that it is about the, um, the development of people in the organization. But I, I would hope it would be something that would be a mandate within all of the teams in the United States Hockey League is to, uh, to help push along people that are working, uh, whether it's in the league office or it's working for your team. Is, uh, it's only better for businesses if you can have people graduate from the United States Hockey League um, to the next league and then get them to the National Hockey League because people want to know, 
where these people have come from, both men and women in all aspects of our game. And um, so, you know, I know I kind of went off a little bit on a tangent there about the players, but, you know, not only players graduate from that league and go on to bigger and better things, but also, you know, staff members and, and broadcasters as well. So um, it's, it's an important feeder to the, to the, you know, to the next step in people's lives. And uh, hopefully people will, will remember where they come from and the time they were able to spend in the, uh, in the USHL. When you were growing up in Chicago, Eddie, the USHL wasn't what it is now. Yeah. And this isn't meant to date you by any means. Yeah. <laughs> you, you took your talents to Stratford, Ontario, to Canada uh, yeah. to prepare yourself for professional hockey. But you've seen firsthand, you mentioned your sons, Eddie, Tommy, and Nick all played in the USHL. So you've seen what that brand of hockey looks like. That was between 06 and now 2015. Do you think, and this might be a difficult question to sit and analyze, but if you're born 20, 30 years later, do you think the USHL would have been the option you would have taken to prepare yourself for pro hockey? Wow, uh, great question. Um, I did have an opportunity to go to, to Dubuque at that time. And again, I'm going back to you know the early 80s at that, at that time. Um, it would definitely have been an option for me. I, I don't think that there's any, you know, any doubt about that. And again, I, I look at, you know, my experience in the USHL as, as a hockey father, as somebody that has worked closely with the United States Hockey League in the past, uh, being a part of a couple of the, of the, uh, the social endeavors there, whether it's been a part of All-Star Weekend or banquets or speaking to teams and what have you. But, um, you know, I, I think that for me, uh, I was pretty sure that I wanted to go to college. Um, but I think, you know, I, I was a little bit ahead of my time as a 15 or 16 year old hockey player. I mean, I, I'm, I was lucky enough and had the invitation to try out for the 1984 U.S. Olympic hockey team in the summer of 83. I was 16 years old when I got invited to try out for the Olympic team in, eight, in 83, 84. Um, you know, do I think I would have, you know, gone to USHL and played? Yeah, I probably would have. Uh, do I think that I would eventually work my way into college? I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, I think my goal was, is once I realized I had some, a God-given gift and the drive and the will and the want to, to uh, not live my life wishing I would have, you know, done something or worked a little harder or, uh, you know, gone to a camp or, you know, shot pucks after school or shot pucks before school. Um, as my mother still tells me to this day, uh, you know, if you would have worked as hard in school as you did in hockey, uh, you know, you know, I would imagine if we talked about it today, my mom said, you know, you probably would have come up with uh, hopefully the virus to uh, cure this worldwide pandemic. I mean, so I, I take that as a great compliment from my mother. Um, and, you know, I, I, all I ever wanted to be was a hockey player and I didn't know how you got to the National Hockey League. So, um, but uh, yeah, I, I could see of myself performing, you know, and playing in the USHL at some point, you know, would I've been there a long time, you know, I, I'm really not sure, but um, at least I got a chance to see it as a hockey guy, not only uh, coaching when I did in Pittsburgh back for a couple of years and, uh, you know, back between 03 and 06, but, you know, also, and more importantly, as a hockey dad of, of meeting a lot of great people and learning a lot and, uh, you know, both positive experiences and negative experiences and, and you move on. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I could probably have seen myself uh, patrolling uh, a center ice position for one of the uh, USHL teams if, uh, if indeed I had uh, had that opportunity a few years later. Well, you mentioned parenting. So from that perspective, obviously you had children play in the league. That's mm -hmm. a different perspective, right, than an analyst, than a coach, than all of your other right. endeavors to send away your kids to billets for the first time. What was that like to become a hockey dad for the USHL as opposed to all of the other aspects in your career? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty easy, Chris, because, you know, I had lived it. I left home when I was 15 years old, as, as Ben had mentioned. I, you know, I left home at 15 to go up to Stratford, Ontario, and play junior B hockey there. So uh, I had lived it. Um, you know, I think it was a little more difficult for my wife than it was uh, for me. Um, as I told my wife, you know, one time when, you know, you have that moment as a parent where, you know, your kids are leaving and you're wondering like, you know, well, what's my purpose in life now? You know, my kids are leaving out the door and it's depressing and whatever. And, you know, and I try to just, you know, try to be the father and the husband and tell my wife, you know, well, you know, look, I, you know, 
yeah, they're, they're leaving. They're 16 and, you know, one's turning 17. And, you know, look, at I left when I was 15 and she looked at me flat out and said, well, you're not my son. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that, that's a fair, you know, that's a fair comment. But, um, you know, look, I look at flat out. I mean, I, I look at the situations both for, you know, my son, Eddie, now who's an assistant coach, uh, uh, with the bed, Mitchie state beavers, uh, gold beavers. Um, he's been there a couple of years working for, for Tom Saratori and, and Travis Winter there, and uh, they've developed a great program there at Bemidji, and really proud of the job that you know Eddie has done there, and been a part of coaching uh, at Niagara and also at Utica. You know, he kind of built his way from going in the USHL and, and playing college hockey at UMass Amherst. But you know, my son Tommy and, and my son Nick. You know, I mean, I look back at the experiences that they all had, and I think as, as a parent, um, and, and look, at, I, I I think I fell into. Uh, getting so tunnel vision about, you know, the opportunity of playing the USHL. And I, and I think I, all the way up, I think I, I, I always tried to put my kids in a situation where that they were going to play. Um, I think it's very hard for a lot of young kids that leave their midget program or high school program and go to the USHL because the USHL is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a man's league. I mean, it's a, it's a league where, you know, you get a lot of teams there where, you know, where coaches and managers, you know, they're, you know, they're looking to win and they want to go with, you know, some older players. So it's hard for kids, you know, 16, 17 years old, A, to leave home and then B, you know, not maybe play as much and sit around and be an extra guy and all those type of things. So, you know, I just think as a parent, um, you know, I think the advice that I've given to friends of mine that have, uh, uh, that kids have played in the league or whatever. And just for example, a, a friend of the family, the Carpenter family, Tyler Carpenter, uh, he played in Omaha and he's with Chicago. And now I think he's back in Omaha, but just talking to his family and stuff and just, you know, just trying to give them guidance, you know, on the, and, uh, you know, once you get, you know, drafted or protected or whatever, it's like, look, you know, like you need for the develop, what's, be what's best for your child? Well, what is best for his development? Um, we're all, we all live in a fast food society where, you know, we see it, we want it, we want to buy it, we want to go there, we want to, we want to do it, you know, everybody's in a hurry, everybody's in a hurry, you know, don't worry about what, you know, Johnny or Mary or April or Eddie is doing, like, you got to worry about yourself and what's best for your child and, um, you know, I, I think that sometimes it's okay to stay back, you know, like, if you're, look, if you're a good player, um, they're going to find you and you're going to eventually make it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're still playing midget at 16 or you're playing high school hockey, you know, uh, you know, nobody can guarantee you, nobody can promise you anything, but I think the learning aspect of the hockey parent and, and three kids that played in the USHL is, you know, I always look back and, and wonder like, you know, what would have happened if, you know, if we, if we would have held somebody back or maybe sent them after Christmas or, just said, you know what, you're not ready for it um, socially, you're not ready for it physically, uh, you're not ready for it hockey wise. And for as hard as it is, you know, you got to, you got to make those decisions. So I think that's the greatest challenge for, for, for hockey parents, especially in the decision of, of going to the USHL or any league doesn't matter is, you know, a, you know, how much is my son going to play? And, uh, you know, how is he going to be able to handle, you know, moving away from home, you know, probably for the first time. So I know there's a lot there, but, you know, there's, there's not a, I mean, I don't want to say there isn't a day that doesn't go by, but, you know, you always wonder, you know, and, and I always wonder too, is like, well, you know, if, if I didn't make the U.S. Olympic hockey team back in 83, 84, you know, what would I have done? You know, would I have gone to the Ontario Hockey League and played for the Toronto Marlboros, or I also was drafted by the the Laval Titans of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. And at that time, a guy by the name of Mario Lemieux was putting up three or 400 points. And I always wondered, well, geez, if I would have went to Laval, um, you know, I probably might have had 150 or 200 goals playing with, playing with, uh, with Ace there. So, um, but I just think, you know, my advice for parents, you know, is look at, ask a lot of questions, uh, but look at your child differently and say, look, is, is, your, is my child ready to, go to a situation where, you know, he may not play a lot. How is he going to handle it? And, uh, and what is best for him, not only today, but most importantly, you know, uh, what's going to be happening down the road. And again, don't be in a hurry. I would tell any young hockey player out there, boy or girl that's watching, um, you know, don't be in a hurry. 
you know, don't worry about, you know, your friends or this person's got a, you know, has got an offer and he's going there or she's going there. Um, you know, like if you're a good player, uh, things will work out for you as long as you have your priorities and your commitments in order. And, um, but that's, you know, that would kind of be my message to the hockey parent and, and also to the young hockey players out there. A terrific message it is. As someone who works in the league, you definitely do see, unfortunately, the player that does show up every once in a while that has been rushed along. And, and mm -hmm. as you well know, Eddie, that can be detrimental to careers in a lot of ways. So very sound advice. Uh, you've been so gracious with your time. Not going to keep you much longer. I, I did want to delve into the broadcasting side sure. a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, again, to tickle the broadcaster in me a little bit. Sure. But starting with more of an overarching question, however, you've covered and you've reached the apex of so many different facets of the hockey world. As a player, U.S. Hockey Hall of Famer, Stanley Cup champion, you made it to the head coaching ranks with Pittsburgh, and now you've been the lead analyst with NBC Sports from the broadcasting side for a number of years, literally the voice of my childhood in a lot of ways. <laughs> So looking at it from that perspective, you had a first in all those different facets. What were you the most nervous for, do you think, as a player, head coach, or a broadcaster? Hmm. I'll be honest with you, Ben. I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. Um, I probably was probably the, the most nervous I ever was is when I probably put on the, uh, the Blackhawk sweater in my very first game in the NHL is probably – because look, I grew up in Chicago. I lived and died as a Blackhawk fan. Um, then I get drafted by the Blackhawks third overall in 1984. And at that particular time, the Blackhawks had the sixth overall pick in the draft. And I actually thought I was going to go to New Jersey with the number two pick. Uh, Mario Lemieux went number one and rightfully so uh, that year uh, to the Pittsburgh Penguins. But, you know, getting drafted by my hometown team and, uh, you know, being the first ever American born native son to be drafted by his hometown team in the first round in the NHL draft is something that uh, um, there aren't many things forever, um, but that is forever. Uh, and I'm very proud of that, of trying to be a, a proud member of uh, the, you know, a, a card carrying member of the union for USA hockey, you know, to be that first guy and to play in my hometown. And look, there was a lot of pressure that came with my hometown. I, I'm not, I've talked about that. I recently wrote a book and talked about that in my book, but I would say, Ben, is um, putting on that sweater for the first time and sitting around a locker room, and I mean, I can still picture it just sitting right here in the old Chicago Stadium. I mean, I remember seeing Murray Bannerman and Steve Larmer and, and Dennis Savard, and, and that happened to be back in the day, that was the smoking section of the locker room, believe it or not. Um, you know, not that the smoke didn't go through the locker room or anything, but that's, you know, that's for another show. But, um, you know, I mean, I had Kurt Frazier to my right, you know, I had Troy Murray to my left. I had Daryl Sutter, our captain across from me, Tommy Lysiak, the late Tommy Lysiak, an idol of mine um, that we lost a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I can still feel it. And it's just, just that sense of, holy cow, like this is a dream. Like I, all I ever wanted was to play in the NHL. And again, I didn't know how to get to the NHL when I was seven or eight years old or 10. I, I didn't know there was a draft. I didn't know any of that. I was just like, you know, wow, I, I want to play in the NHL. And there I am as an 18 year old Chicago kid putting on that Blackhawk sweater for the first time. And um, like I, that was probably, you know, that was probably the most nervous I've ever been uh, professionally. Um, and then the two other times uh, is when, uh, when I met my wife for the first time on an airplane and uh, being in the delivery room the first time when my oldest son, Eddie, was born. That's probably the most nervous I've ever been uh, away from hockey. And, uh, you know, people ask me this a lot of time. Uh, a lot of the time is, um, like, you know, I've been very lucky and very blessed and had some incredible guidance along the way from my mom and dad and, and people in my corner. But you know, it's like, what, what do I, like, what is my, what do I feel is my greatest accomplishment? And I've had a lot of things happen in my professional life, my hockey life, uh, my horse racing life as a broadcaster as well with NBC. But, um, you know, I think I'm most proud of being a dad. I'm most proud of being a, a, a husband um, and what I've been able to accomplish away from, um, you know, away from the 
blue lines and, and blue paint and, uh, you know, the, the big lights of being a player or a coach or a broadcaster. And look at everything I have, I owe to the game of hockey. So, I mean, it's all intertwined. And, you know, it's my youngest son, Nick, is an aspiring broadcaster himself. He, he worked in uh, the East Coast Hockey League last year uh, with the Indy Fuel. And, and uh, so oh, it's, it's in our blood. It's always going to be in our blood. And I think if you see that sign, uh, above my uh, chalkboard there, and I know nobody has a chalkboard anymore because everybody has a dry erase board nowadays, but I'm um, showing my stripes. Um, it is all about hockey in our family, and it always will be, but I always will feel, and, and until the day I'm not here, is, uh, I'll always feel the greatest accomplishment um, for me uh, will have been my family and uh, the way I've tried to carry myself uh, as a representative of the game and it was, you know, at a lot of different levels. You do have so much to give, Eddie, and that's the thing that stands out about not only what we've talked about, the playing career, coaching career, broadcasting career, families always come first for you. Anytime you read anything that you've written or listen to you on a podcast, you bring up family. This podcast will be a testament to that, just like the rest of them has been. You have a lot to give. When you think about your life experience, look back to 2017 with your battle with colon cancer and overcoming that, and you've spoken very publicly about what that did to you, how incredible your family was, specifically your wife, Diana, during that time. What would you say to encapsulate that, that life has taught you that you'd want the next generation to learn? Because we will have a lot of younger demographic hockey people listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think there's a lot there, Ben, but I think for me is, uh, you know, I learned a lot about myself when I was going through that personal battle. I mean, look, I, you know, we, we all think we're invincible in life. Like we all do. It's, it's just human nature. It's, it's a part of our DNA. Uh, because one day, all of a sudden, I wake up and flat out, I couldn't go to the bathroom, uh, which was not normal for Eddie Olchek back in the summer of, of 2017. And, uh, you know, uh, I waited a couple of days. And then all of a sudden, I got violently sick. And they tell me that I had a blockage in my colon. And then on August the 4th at 7.07 .07 p.m. of 2017, I got the phone call that kind of changed my life as far as the medical part of it. And my doctor told me that I had stage three colon cancer and we're recommending uh, surgery. And uh, uh, you're gonna have uh, six months of chemo and then we'll reassess from there. And I had a six and a half hour surgery where they removed the tumor the size of my fist. and. Pretty much from then on, it was like, okay, my first question was, well, how long do I have to live? And when you have a dose of reality like that, um, not that I needed it, but it was like, okay, um, I'm in a battle and I wanted to crawl, I wanted to crawl under a rock and not burden anybody with it. But when you're so-called in the public eye um, and people, you know, you start to uh, disappearing from uh from public and you cancel public appearances and you're not allowed to play in a charity hockey game you know you want to try to control the message as best you can and, and that's what we did but you know getting into the battle and and uh and, 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 and understanding the disease and like i said is like how long do i have and uh you know where am i in my life and when i was going through my battle the, the chemotherapy and look at cancer does not discriminate. Uh, it, it affects sadly all of us in some form or fashion. Um, but when I got into my second treatment, um, the side effects just pretty much broke me down. And I was probably at the lowest in my life that I had ever been because I would just all of a sudden my nose would bleed or, um, you know, I had terrible headaches. I had neuropathy in my fingers and my feet. Um, you know, I would vomit and then I would just go to the bathroom without, having to go like I would just go number two without having any control and I'm just like I'm done I quit like how am I gonna you know how am I gonna get through today let alone how am I gonna get through five more months of hell and I just told my wife I quit and at that time I was it broke me it brought me to my knees and I'm not embarrassed to say that because I think it's a real reality out there for a lot of people, regardless of their battling cancer or any other uh, challenge in their life, whether it's physically or mentally. And I told my wife I'm done. And my wife just looked at me and she gave me the greatest inspirational speech I ever had in any locker room or uh, any household in my, in my lifetime. And my wife just looked at me and she just grabbed me and said, look, you got to fight. You got to fight for me. You got to fight for our kids and you got to fight for all the people that love you. And I'm actually 
sitting probably 10 feet away from where my wife gave me that, that talk. And every day that I walk through our basement, I, there isn't a time that I don't walk by there and know that this was a moment of my life where I needed, I needed help. Really never needed any help, so to speak, you know, prior to that. Um, but I admitted I needed help and my wife gave it to me. And, you know, we had a moment that lasted probably 30 minutes and all I did was cry for 35 of it. So when you really think about that, what I just said, like it was an emotional time and I'm like, okay, I'm going to refer back to my hockey playing days and, and my coach and look, I never quit at anything in my life. And I was on the verge of quitting and I was like, okay, I'm going to just go one day at a time and I'm going to go day to day. And in five months, the doctors will come back and tell me after I have my scan. And then I'm going to, re- then I'm going to worry about then, then I'm not going to worry about that now. So I'm going to go as day to day. And I started setting goals for myself, guys. I, I just started setting goals about, you know, being back to, to two games uh, on television, whether it was locally in Chicago or nationally with Doc Emmerich on NBC, uh, getting back and doing some horse racing um, on TV uh, with NBC, uh, getting down to the University of Alabama to see my daughter graduate there, um, you know, going to see my, uh, you know, going to see my boys play hockey, um, you know, just all those, all those things. I, I, just, I just said, you know what, I'm just going to live day to day. And I uh, was lucky enough to be able to get through and then, you know, be clean and clear. And, and I have been since the last couple of years. But, you know, I, I just I want people to know that, you know, like it's it's, it's a reality in, in our lives, regardless of what's going on, is that you know, we, we all deal with things a, a certain way. And to hey, look, at if you're not feeling well um, and you know there's maybe something wrong, it, it's OK to raise your hand and ask for help. It's OK to. Uh, reach out to a friend or a doctor or to to uh, to your to your better half or your mom or dad and just say you know something's not right because I knew a couple of days prior to that I just wasn't feeling well I didn't say anything the next thing you know what triggered was I couldn't go to the bathroom and that's what the domino was that eventually got me to be diagnosed uh, with colon cancer and uh, I hope people hear my story I hope people read my book I hope people um, you know look at my goal is is that you know, when, when people hear my story or read my book, it's like I, 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 when I had a couple of book signings prior to the pandemic, it was like, I, I always tell people is like, I, I hope that I can make an impact on you. Uh, and I hope you live and love a little bit more after you read my story. And if people can be inspired by me, whether it's just getting through the day, it's staying away from the disease or giving them inspiration and saying, Hey, that old broken down hockey player can do it. Well, then I can do it too. And uh, sadly, I've been um, reached out to by, I, I want to say it's been thousands of people now since I was diagnosed back in 2017. And uh, I try to communicate with as many people as I can, whether I knew them or not. And a lot of them I don't know, but they're looking for hope. They're looking for inspiration. And if I've been able to bring that to them, then it was well worth me spending time with you guys today of allowing me to tell my story about my battle. But at the end of the day, it's, it's uh, I think when I was going through it, and the last thing I will say about it is that, um, you know, I was scared. I was scared when I was going through the chemo because I didn't know what was going to be on the other end. But the one thing I will say is, and it's probably the one thing that is talked about the most about when people know my story is that I was very much at peace when I was going through my battle. Now, I was still scared. I was still worried. I was still, you know, wanted to be around, you know, to, to, uh, to see my son get married. And, and, I, and since all of this, I've become a grandfather for the first time. Uh, my daughter, my granddaughter, Audrey Marie, was born back on July the 7th. And, and my son, Eddie, and his wife, Erica, the proud parents. And, um, you know, I, I, I had a reason to fight. But also, too, is that when I was going through my battle, even though I was at my lowest, I was very much at peace with my life. And I said, look, and it's hard to say, but if my time was up, I felt that the most important people in my life knew how I felt about them. And I've always, I don't know where I learned it, um, but I learned it a long time ago. And I've always expressed to the most important people in my life, what they've meant to me. And I've always said to them, say, look, I just want you to know, and you need to tell me that, you know, is that 
Uh, you've meant a lot to me and my life has been complete with you in it. And it certainly starts with my wife, Diana, of 32 years. But um, I've always lived that way. And, 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 and I think that helped me get through. I think that really helped me get through is that uh, I was able to have that open dialogue with the most important people in my life that my life has been better because you've been a part of it. And that helped me get through. And I, I think that fighting aspect is I wanted to fight for them more than for Eddie Olchek. That helped me get through my dip, most difficult times. And if somebody knows my story and I can help them, um, then uh, it was well worth me putting uh, pen to paper for 14 months of writing my book and telling my story. And uh, as some of my former friends, I say that in quotations, um, they all wanted to know if there were crayons with this book that I wrote. Um, <laughs> and uh, no, there are no crayons with this book. And as I told them, yeah, you're not smart enough to use a book with crayons first off. So, um, but it, I'm very proud of it. And uh, I just hope that, uh, you know, I can help someone along the line and, and to know my story of, you know, everybody in my life told me that, you know, I would never make it to the NHL because I was an American born hockey player and I was from Chicago. Everybody told me I wouldn't make the U.S. Olympic hockey team at 16 because I was too young. People told me I would never be the first American born uh broadcaster on national tv for u.s television and i've been able to accomplish that th for the last 14 years um and i didn't achieve those goals to prove anybody wrong it was because i had set my mind to trying to be and i had a gift and i wanted to be the best that i could but i will honestly say besides a few people um on that thing called the world wide web and uh, and in social devices um, I had very few people not tell me I wasn't going to beat the disease. And that certainly helped me get through my most difficult times. And, uh, the team of doctors that I had and the support that I had, I'll, I'll never be able to repay. So, uh, I wasn't able to do it by myself because, uh, I didn't think I was tough enough to be able to accomplish it. And uh, I was lucky enough to have that support. So uh, I appreciate you guys uh, allowing me to, uh, tell that story in a very, uh, you know, in a, 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 a short period of time, but I think you got to get the gist of, uh, of kind of where I've kind of been and where I'm trying to get to and the type of life that I'm uh, trying to lead now and, and helping as many people as I can. And, uh, and let's not forget the caretakers as well in this whole thing. I mentioned about the frontline workers during this pandemic, but the caretakers and caregivers, uh, my wife, I never saw my wife weak. I never saw my wife down. I never saw her worried. I never saw her uh, ever jaded at all around me. Now I know when she was not around me, I'm sure she had her moments where she was scared and my kids were scared, but um, let's make sure we're taking care of the caretakers as well in this big picture when people are going through their battles. Well, Eddie, thank you very much for sharing that. You are going to leave a litany of legacies throughout the hockey world. That one though might very well be the most meaningful and, and certainly it's very, there's proof out there that you have already touched a lot of lives and will continue to do so. So thank you for sharing that. I know we're a little bit heavy on time right now. I want to end on a fun note. You're an sure. incredible storyteller. <laughs> why you're able to do what you do on the broadcast so well. And so I wanted to give you a chance to tell a story at the end of this. I was thinking coming into this, what would be a great opportunity to let you showcase your storytelling? And I thought about as someone who goes in front of a live microphone, anybody who's gone on radio or television has had a major foot in their mouth moment where mm -hmm you just can't quite get something out. And mm -hmm. I think about like myself or Chris or Brent, we've had that opportunity to do it at a lower level where there maybe aren't that many people listening. You with your status had to jump right on to Pittsburgh FSN, Fox mm -hmm. Sports Pittsburgh, I should say. Yeah. We were right into the fire. Is there a moment you can think about where you look back and think, man, did I have egg on my face during that moment? <laughs> you got through it. <laughs> Oh, I mean, look at we we don't have enough time. I mean, I still <laughs> I still do it now. You know, I mean, look at when you get a little bit older, you get a little bit more forgetful. I'm just preparing you guys for 25, 30 years down the road. It, you know, as the old proverbial, you know, saying, I won't say it, but certain stuff happens. You know, stuff happens yeah. when you get a little bit older. But, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's anything. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's anything specific where I, you know, I kind of look back and. Um, you know, say, or I said something, you know, where it was, a, you know, a Freudian slip or a slip of the tongue or, 
you know, our, our, our people in our truck hit the dump button there when I should have said a, uh, you know, I, I said a, uh, I think a player had just come back from a, uh, well, what he came back from, he had surgery because he had a bulging disc in his back. And I think I might have slipped up and maybe mispronounced the last word in a funny way. And I think maybe the people inside the truck maybe have pushed down, but look at, when you're on live TV, stuff is going to happen, right? And it's going to sound like you said something or what have you. But um, I, you know what? I don't, I don't know if there's any really specific time, Ben, where there was a time where I sat there and it was just like one of those moments that will be on, uh, you know, you make me laugh TV or the World Wide Web for the, I'm sure there are certain things that have happened, uh, you know, when, the, you know, a hockey game is going on. But um, I, I think the one thing I will say, is um, I've all, and again, I, I think I learned this from my folks, um, the real Ed and Diana Olchek, by the way, and that happens to be uh, my, my name, obviously, and my wife's name. So we have Ed and Diana, and we have Eddie and Diana. So it gets a little confusing around uh, the holiday times. And oh, by the way, then, well, of course, our son, Eddie. So it gets a little confusing. But um, is I think it's really, really important um, is when you do make a mistake or you uh, misidentify or you know, you're know you wrong on something. I think people enjoy humility. I think people enjoy, hey, you know what, my bad. You know, I, I goofed up. I mean, I did it the other night in, uh, in game one of Dallas, Colorado, where Dallas, you know, was on a roll and they got up and, uh, and after describing the goals and everything else, you know, I, I think I just said, you know, yeah, the abs with a 3-1 lead. And I just got done talking about Dallas for five minutes. And, you know, again, it's just like – and then I got on my talk back, you know, with my little machine here in my headset. I'm able to talk to my producer. And I said, did I just say the abs with a 3-1 lead? Because I thought I did. And, and I'm like – so he goes – uh, he goes, Edzo, I, I don't know. I was doing something. I was like, well, 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 what good are you? I mean, I'm like, can you help, can you help me out? And, and then I'm like, ask somebody in the truck. And it's like, you know, it's crickets. And I'm like, and I'm a, look, I'm a big believer. In it, and I have this relationship in Chicago and in, in the NHL and NBC is look at, if I say something wrong. I need somebody to get in my ear and say, Hey, you know, you said the score was three, one, this or three, one. like I, I'm good with it. I like that's humility. And then, you know, nobody was answering me and I'm going to go, you know what, I'm just going to go out there and blurt it out there on national TV and just say, you know, folks, you know, I just want to correct something. I think I said Colorado was up three to one, but obviously it was Dallas. But, you know, I just wanted to, you know, I just want to clarify it because, you know, again, like you make a mistake, it's going to happen. You know, you can't worry about what's going on in social media and all that. Kind of, look at mistakes are going to happen. It's live TV. Um, so um, but I, and I corrected it and I think I indeed said, I did say the abs had the three to one lead or whatever, which, which they did. And so I just think humility in life in general, I, I think people respect that. And I think that's how you build credibility. And, um, you know, I, I got a lot of great hockey stories. If you guys ever get bored on, uh, you guys ever need to fill a half hour, I could give you three or four stories that, uh, that would probably uh, knock your socks off, but uh, maybe that's for another day. So I would just say humility more than anything else, Ben. Um, when it comes to that aspect of, of being on the air. And, and, uh, and there have been times there uh, where, especially when I work in Chicago with the great Pat Foley doing Blackhawk games, um, we're known to go off the rails every once in a while. And uh, sometimes, the, uh, sometimes the funny train uh, is really hard to reel in. And uh, sometimes we get called in for a meeting, but that's, you know, that's all part of it. But, um, you know, if we're seeing somebody eat a little uh, soft serve ice cream and you can see my sign back there is, uh, you know, all you need is a little love and some ice cream as well. Um, you know, sometimes when we see people devouring a soft serve ice cream, uh, we get a little excited as well. But you know, look at, in, in the big picture, um, you know, life is good and, uh, you know, we like to have a little fun even though we got a job to do. But I think humility is really important when you're doing a broadcast. Well, clearly, Eddie, humility is really important for you in the overall scope of life. You've always come across that way in the opportunities I've had to listen to you or watch you or read about you. And it was great today to get to, to not meet you in the flesh, but to meet you virtually and to see that firsthand. 
can't thank you enough for this. Not only uh, the great banter, but certainly stuff that will be inspiring for not only our listeners to hear, but for a few uh, young broadcasters like us to hear as well. So thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, can't wait to tune into the game tonight, hopefully, and, uh, and hear the great Eddie O, who we were talking with earlier this morning, uh, breaking us the story. Okay, guys, thanks for having me. God bless you guys and stay safe. And I wish everybody in the USHL uh, the best of luck. Hopefully we'll be dropping the puck sooner than later and uh, look forward to the next uh, next wave of uh, National Hockey League players coming from the uh, the best feeder in our country to uh, to bigger and better things. And again, it's uh, my relationship with the league and uh, the experiences that I've had have been uh, tremendous and uh, really looking forward to uh, hopefully all getting on the right side of this and uh, look forward to seeing the next hockey player uh, come from the USHL. And anytime I get the opportunity, I always like to give those little plugs to uh, former USHL grads in the National Hockey League uh, patrolling the, uh, the ice there at the highest level. So I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, Best of luck to everybody and stay safe, and uh, we'll see you guys down the road. Thanks, Eddie. Well, wow, another fantastic interview, as always. Eddie Olchuk, thank you so much for your time. I and mean, we thanked him how many times during that podcast, but, I mean, he's literally calling games every single day, and you and I know very well how much prep and time it takes to prepare for a broadcast, especially how hard it is now because – He's not even there. He has to watch games on TV just like us and analyze the game. So for him to take time out of his day in the middle of all of this craziness that is the NHL bubble and the playoffs, I mean, what a guy, right? That's just amazing. So thank you again, Eddie. A real testament to the kind of character this guy has and how much he cares about the product of the game and, and USA Hockey for sure. Uh, so a huge thank you to Eddie for coming on with us. And I was super intrigued to ask him about – what this whole broadcast situation has been like. Obviously he was at NBC sports studios doing all these games. And I thought his response to that was great. It was great getting an inside look at that. And he is just such an interesting guy. And I talked about that at the open of the show, all the different perspectives he has about the game of hockey and um, a storyteller too. We could, it's very evident how much of a storyteller this guy is and uh, almost a Pied Piper of the sport in, in the NHL and, um, such a, a beloved guy. And, and also, I was really excited to have him on, not only just period, but during this time, because we've had some big names on. That's one of our biggest names we've had on. And I think we all thought that if we didn't get some of those big names before the NHL restarted again, we probably weren't going to get them. So yeah. uh, a big shout out to Brent Meske for getting that done, despite uh, all the time that Eddie is having to pour into his broadcast. And then, of course, Eddie for taking time with us here this morning. Well, some exciting news, Ben, because the world is crazy, as we've talked about this entire podcast. But got some big news. The USHL will be resuming play on November 6th, or at least that's the plan. 54-game schedule starting on November 6th with how crazy the world is and how current events continue to change biweekly, I feel like. But that's at least the plan, right? So it might still not go that way. might be different. But as of right now, the league is working absolutely crazy to make sure that November 6th, the puck is dropped. Obviously, any league that is looking to start a season right now, anytime in the near future, is saying the same thing. Everything is extremely fluid, and it has to be because – we unfortunately still don't know that much about COVID-19 and, and the spikes and the valleys and how this whole thing's going to shake out. But right now, anything that, that can be put out in front of us, no matter how fluid it is, is exciting. And it was the same thing when the NHL announced months ago that they were going to come back in August and they were able to pull it off. Now, granted, the USHL is a little bit different. You want the bubble scenario, but talking with you, talking with Brent and others around the USHL know that the, the committee and, and the board of governors and, and commissioner Garrity has been working diligently on how do we do this as safely as possible, but also how do we provide not only the entertainment for our fans, but 
the vehicle that this league needs to be for our players to be able to prepare for the collegiate and professional levels. And it sure sounds like they're doing a whale of a job and, and making this as safe as possible. Sounds like regional schedules are going to be a big part of it to try to prevent as much travel as, or to, I should say to have as little of travel as possible, not have as many overnights in a hotel that we're used to seeing and used to accommodating during a normal USHL schedule. So uh, kudos to everybody that's making things happen. And we're obviously uh, hoping and praying for a start date on November 6th, but uh, there's one thing that I have confidence in, and that's that the USHL is going to handle this as well as they can and, and put the players and staffs and everybody's safety at the prominence of this whole scenario. Anything else, Ben? No, it was just great to talk hockey again today with yeah. you guys. Um, let, let's not have as big of a gap in time between today and the next time we sit down to do this because it's always, it's always a treat. For sure. Well, for Eddie Olchick and Ben Gisselson, as always, too, Brent Meske behind the scenes doing all the hard work. I'm Chris Treft, and this was the You Show podcast. This is the You Show podcast.